Happy Easter. Happy Easter. He's risen. Amen. Amen. Hey, if you are new with us this morning, I just want to welcome you. Thanks so much for being with us. My name is Lucas Rogers. I'm the lead pastor here. And, and uh, thanks for choosing to spend your Sunday Easter morning with us. We're glad that you're here. Uh, if you'd like to get to know a little bit more about our church, a couple of easy ways to do that. One is hopefully you got a bulletin when you came in. In the back, there's a QR code. It'll take you to our online resources and information. You can check us out that way. You can also just skip all that and, and come talk to me. And uh, I'll tell you what I know. Uh, but we're so glad that you join us here this morning. We're glad that you're here. Now, let me tell you a couple of things that are going on that I'm, I'm pretty excited about. One is that next week we've got a lunch, all church lunch. It's springtime. It's time to celebrate. Uh, I'm not used to winter. And so I, I like springtime. And so we're going to have an all church lunch and we're going to be together as a family. It's going to be great. If you've not RSVP'd for that, you don't have to. We just may not have food for you. So it's up to you, you know, your choice. Uh, but then also with that, we're going to have a baptismal service celebration, and we've got a number of folks who are going to be publicly uh, declaring their faith in Christ through baptism, and I'm, I'm super excited about that, and so I'd love for you to join us and be part of all of that together as a family. And then one more thing, just to let you know, in two weeks, we're going to start a new sermon series looking at the book of Exodus. It's, it's a book about how God frees the people of Israel from bondage into a new life. And it's something, I think, a message that all of us need to hear because there's so many different kinds of bondage that we experience in our lives, and God wants to give us freedom. Amen? So I hope you'll join us for that as well in a couple of weeks. Um, let me pray for us, and we're going to dive into this week's message, all right? Jesus, hallelujah, you're alive. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that. As we remembered on Friday, and as Steve has told us, we remember that you were put into this grave, and it just seemed like all was lost. It seemed like that was the end of the story, and, and there was no possible way forward, no hope, and then you did the impossible. And God raised you to new life, and Jesus, it showed us and it, it proved to us once and for all that you are exactly who you say that you are, that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And so we're here this morning to worship you and to proclaim that you are alive. There's a lot of, of people in the world who want to keep you in the grave. They want to say that you're dead. And this is all just a big hoax. But we know the truth, that you're risen, that you're alive, and that you're coming back. God, we, we look at our world right now, and there's so, many, there's so many graves. There's emotional graves. There's psychological graves. There's literal graves. There's so much brokenness and so much sin, so much sorrow, so much sickness. And now we're seeing war and death. And it would be easy to think that the only way this story ends is with a grave. But Jesus, you know the way out of the grave. And so we come before you right now, and we just ask that you would meet us here because you are alive. That you would speak to us through your word powerfully, that your spirit would meet us in this place and in this time, and that you would, you would show us what it looks like to, to follow you. You would show us what it looks like to know you, and God, I just pray right now as, as we open up this word that it would not be my words that are remembered, but it, it would be your eternal word, your word that is shaping us and changing us, and that you would make us into who you have created us to be so that we can follow you more faithfully into the life that you call us to. And that in that, we would call others to know you because you are the only hope this world has. And so we praise you this morning because you are not a dead God that we follow you are the living, living and risen one. So we pray all this in your name. Amen. If you have a Bible, we're at the end of Matthew. We're going to look at uh, Gospels. Matthew is the first Gospel in the New Testament, if you turn over there. And we're going to be at the end of chapter 27. If you've got a Bible, you can grab that. If you've got a phone, you can pull up a Bible app. Uh, and otherwise, we're going to have the text up here behind me, so you can follow along that way as well. Uh, but this morning, it is Easter, so we're going to look at a very traditional Easter passage. 
because I want us to consider just for a little while what I think, without a doubt, is one of the most extraordinary claims of the Christian faith. This idea that this man, Jesus, Almost 2,000 years ago, he was executed by Roman authorities. He was put into a tomb. And then three days later, he got up and he walked out alive. That Jesus came back to life, not in just sort of this metaphysical sense, not as an idea or a symbol or some sort of neat ideology or something that we kind of wish was true or he lives on in our memories, but that he literally physically got up and left. He came fully back to life. It's an extraordinary claim. It's almost an unbelievable claim. I want to share um, kind of an admission to you. It's a little bit embarrassing, um, but uh, I don't like to tell this story, but, but this past November, uh, December, excuse me, I was, we were getting ready to move. Some of you uh, know that we recently moved here from Texas. And so we were in the midst of this move. We were getting ready for the moving truck to come and take all of our stuff away. And we were going to be packing everything we could in a minivan and driving 25, 28 hours out here to New Jersey. And so all sorts of logistics that were going on. And it was at that moment that my phone decided to die. And uh, it didn't totally die. It was just enough to really make me uncomfortable because it kept dropping calls and it wouldn't have GPS, which felt kind of important given the journey we were about to be on. And so I thought, okay, I've got to get a new phone, or I've got to get this one fixed. And I'm not somebody, I I don't like getting new phones. I don't like upgrading my phone. I'm a pretty cheap guy. And so I went to Apple and said, you got to fix my phone. They said, we can't call your service provider. So I called the service provider, and I talked to this guy, Kevin, and Kevin said, have I got a deal for you? (laughs) And I can't believe that I bought it. (laughs) It's really embarrassing because I never do that. But Kevin was so convincing. He said, listen, there's a promotional going on right now. And for $1 a month, I'm going to send you a new phone. Everything is going to be great. And he explained how all the payment was going to play out. It was $1 a month. And I was kind of desperate. I just thought, you know what? Let's just go for it. What's the worst that could happen? And then he sent me the phone. And it wasn't $1 a month. It was almost $200 a month. And by the time it was all said and done, it took months of phone calls and and trying to get through to our service provider and to get them to make everything better. Uh, We finally got everything put right, but they actually ended up opening a case file investigation on poor Kevin because he was either incompetent or he was a con man. And so they were going to get to the bottom of it. I, I, I was just kicking myself, though. You know, I should know better. Life teaches you pretty quickly that if something sounds too good to be true, it probably is, right? And if you haven't learned that lesson, I have this phone that I would love to sell you. It's, <laughs> it's a great deal. I'll, I'll be right out there later. See, I, I think that one of the reasons, and, and oftentimes the, the primary reason that we struggle to believe in God, even those of us who have been part of the church, that we, we struggle with this idea of faith in God it's, it's actually not because we're looking at all the evidence. It's not because we're weighing all the pros and cons and trying to sift through what we can find historically or, or even weighing philosophical or theological arguments. That's, that's not why we struggle. I think oftentimes it's because the idea of God simply sounds too good to be true. I mean, the idea that God created the world and that he created you and he loves you and has a, wants to have a relationship with you it just sounds too good to be true. And we're, we're just not that naive anymore, right? We're, we're too sophisticated. We're too enlightened to believe in fairy tales. We're too educated to believe in myths and legends. And we've learned not to believe things that sound too good to be true. And I got to tell you that there's not much that sounds more too good to be true than the idea of coming back to life. That's really a step beyond, isn't it? This idea, I mean, there's a lot of people who might believe in an afterlife of some sort, that your, your soul lives on, or your spirit lives in some sort of another world or in an alternate dimension or some, something, or maybe just living on in someone's memory. A lot of people believe that, but what we're talking about here is a literal, physical, bodily resurrection. This idea that after you are dead and your body has, maybe it's been cremated or maybe it's just decomposed, that God will actually bring your, all of your, your molecules and your atoms and everything back together again and reform you and make you a new person. Like that is a, a seemingly unbelievable, extraordinary idea. But wouldn't it be great if it was true? 
See, see, maybe there's some people a long time ago, and maybe they believe this kind of nonsense. You know, maybe, maybe people from a long time ago, they could believe in some sort of resurrection like that. But see, again, we, we know better. We've taken chemistry classes and biology classes. And what we know is that dead things, and especially dead people, they don't come back to life. But wouldn't it be something if they did? One of the reasons that I'm convinced that the gospel accounts are true is because they were written by eyewitnesses. That, that they were either written by disciples who were actually there seeing the events, or they were written by people who were closely associated with those disciples. So the, the disciples were essentially providing all that we know within the gospel accounts. And yet, these same disciples in those accounts, they almost never get anything right. In fact, when Jesus is, is arrested and tried and executed, we don't find the disciples as these paragons of strength and courage. Instead, what we find is that they are running for the hills. They scatter and they're terrified. And they're, they're afraid for their lives and they're hiding like, like little school children. See, I don't know about you, but if I was making up a story that was going to include me in it, I would make myself sound as heroic as possible. How about you? And yet the disciples, when they tell the story, that's not what they sound like at all. Because if you're writing a true story, one in which there are other eyewitnesses present who can either correct you or call you out for making yourself sound a little too good to be true then you have to stick to the facts. And the fact is that when Jesus died and was buried, the disciples weren't looking for a miracle. They weren't expecting divine intervention. They were not looking for Jesus to walk out of the tomb because that would have been too good to be true. And they knew better. And so look at how Matthew sets up the scene for us as, as Jesus, he's been executed. And then look at what happens next. Chapter 27, verse 57. As evening approached, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who had himself become a disciple of Jesus. And going to Pilate, he asked for Jesus' body. And Pilate ordered that it would be given to him. And so Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb. In other words, this is an unused tomb. There's nobody else there. No confusion about whose body is being put in the tomb that he had had cut out of the rock and he rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. You roll a big stone, that was standard because you wanted to keep grave robbers out. And then Mary Magdalene and, and, and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. And I would have to stop here because this is the end. See, we're used to reading ahead and we do that too quickly, what we have to do is to stop here because for the disciples and for everyone who was following Jesus and everyone who hoped that he was the one they'd been waiting for, this is the end of the story. There is no tomorrow. There is no Sunday after Friday. This is the only present that they have. This is the end of the story. The disciples have scattered and we're left with only two women sitting here grieving, watching Jesus be buried. It's over. Have you ever been at a place in your life where you could no longer imagine a, pres a future other than your present? You see, sometimes something happens in our life that is so catastrophic that shatters our world to such a degree that it actually paralyzes our ability to imagine a future other than what we're living right now. And this is what you feel when you have those days when you can't even seem to get yourself out of bed because why bother? Because it's, nothing's going to have changed today from yesterday. Nothing could possibly improve. Tomorrow is not better than today. There is no future. There is only the present. And see, for the disciples, their present is all that they have. This, this present reality that Jesus is dead. There is no future. Jesus was their future. And Jesus is dead. Now, what's a little bit surprising about this is that Jesus had told them exactly what to expect. Jesus repeatedly, in the gospel accounts, we find that he keeps telling them, I'm going to be killed, but I'm going to be raised from the dead, but they never get it. Never. In fact, Peter 
After Jesus tells them this at one point, he says, I'm going I'm to be killed. I'm going to be raised from the dead. Peter says, pulls Jesus aside and begins to scold him for being too negative. I love this. Can you imagine? It's like, Jesus, can, can I, just a second, come here. Listen, man, you're killing morale. I mean, look at poor Thaddeus. He's all down in the dumps. Bartholomew hasn't touched his food. I mean, come on, can we, can we let's, let's practice. A little, little more positivity here, Jesus. A little more positive. Turn those frowns upside down. Half full, not half empty, Jesus. Can we try this? See, for Peter, he's telling Jesus not to be negative because whatever he thought Jesus meant by raised from the dead, it wasn't a bodily resurrection. It wasn't that Jesus was going to come back to life. That wasn't even beginning to be on Peter's radar. It never crossed his mind. See, one of the misconceptions of us enlightened modern people is that we know so much. But those people who lived a long time ago, they were so dumb. They were just so ignorant and naive. And they, they probably believed that all kinds of people would just spontaneously come back to life. They believed in all kinds of superstitions, didn't they? Yeah, the problem with that is that's not true at all. The problem is that if you actually look at what historians of the ancient world will tell you is that universally it's, it's recognized that while the, even within the pagan world, within the pagan religions, they would argue and dispute all kinds of things about the afterlife, what it might mean for your soul or your spirit. But you know what they all agreed on? Complete consensus, nobody ever comes back to life. Nobody thought that, period. And even within Judaism... There were some people, some Jews, who believed in a resurrection, but not all. It was, it was very much disputed. A lot of people did not believe in a resurrection, but even those who believed that there was a resurrection, what they believed was in a general resurrection, that at the end of time, at the end of the world, all the good people, all the righteous people, at the same time, would come back to life. And there is literally no evidence to suggest that anyone expected a single individual person to come back to life in the middle of history, in the middle of a broken world still tainted by sin. Nobody believed that. Nobody anticipated that. So N.T. Wright, who is arguably the world's foremost New Testament historian, he puts it this way, something had happened, talking about the resurrection, something had happened something which was not at all what the disciples expected or hoped for, something around which they had to reconstruct their lives. They never saw it coming. Nobody was expecting this kind of thing. No kind of conversion experience would have invented it, no matter how they felt, no matter how many hours they poured over the scriptures. To suggest otherwise is to stop doing history and enter into a fantasy world of our own. In other words, the disciples were not waiting for a miracle. They were not waiting for divine intervention. They were not waiting for Jesus to walk out of the tomb. That was too good to be true. And in fact, ironically, it's the Pharisees who take Jesus far more seriously than Jesus' own disciples. So in the next section, look at this, starting in verse 62. It says, the next day, the one after preparation day, the, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. Notice they don't have to keep a guard there forever. It's just three days. They, they knew what Jesus said. Just three days. Just make sure nothing happens in those three days and then we're good. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. See, the Pharisees assumed that the disciples would take Jesus' words seriously. But the disciples didn't take Jesus' words seriously. And so the Pharisees end up hatching this elaborate plan to make sure that the disciples never do something that the disciples never intended to do. And so the Pharisees said, you guys are never going to get in here to steal Jesus' body. And the disciples went, what are you talking about? We would never do, why would we do that? 
Isn't it interesting that sometimes people who don't believe in God take God more seriously than those of us who claim we do? I just find this so interesting that I know so many people who refuse to believe in God, they reject God because they actually take God really seriously. They know that if they believe in God, then God is going to want to change their life and they don't want God to mess with their lives. And so they refuse to believe in God because they take him so seriously. But I know so many other people who claim to believe in God and then live like he doesn't exist. Isn't that fascinating? It's kind of sad. You see, the Pharisees, they took Jesus' words very seriously. Seriously enough that they wanted to make sure that he stayed dead. See, what the Pharisees understood was that with Jesus dead, whatever faith he inspired, it would die with him. Because nobody follows a dead Messiah. They'd seen this before. Messiahs would come, and the Romans would kill them, and the people would disperse, and they began looking for another Messiah. Because they're like, look, if Jesus is dead, then there's nothing for the people to believe in. But if some zealous fanatic is able to get his way into the tomb and steal Jesus' body, then he might deceive other people, and other people get caught up in this whole, this whole charade, and the Pharisees would have a bigger mess to clean up than before. And so they're absolutely bent on making sure that they can prove that there's no resurrection. So what they need to do is keep the tomb sealed to show that Jesus was dead and composing in the grave, and then there would be nothing for his followers to believe in. Because if Jesus is dead, there is no faith. Gerd Ludman was a German biblical scholar. He passed away about a year ago now. And he was uh, kind of made some waves because for a long time he actually claimed to be a Christian even while he denied that Jesus had risen from the dead. But what's interesting is that later in life, he sort of recanted that position and said, you're right, I'm not a Christian. You can't be a Christian and not believe in the resurrection. Because Christianity isn't an ideology. It's not a movement. It's not a moral code. Christianity is about a person. And so Jesus is either alive or the faith means nothing. The Apostle Paul, he says much the same thing in his, his first letter to the Corinthian church. If you've read that, he says that if Jesus is still dead, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then our faith is meaningless, it's hopeless, we might as well pack it up and go home. This is all just a waste of our time if Jesus is still dead. And see, this is why the Pharisees were willing to go to such lengths, to risk going to Pilate and interrupting him, bothering him, and say, hey, we need a guard, and we need to seal this tomb because they wanted to make sure that no one could ever believe that Jesus was alive. And then that would be the end of this tiresome Jesus who had made so much trouble for them with such a pain in their side. All they had to do was to make sure that no one who was outside of the tomb could get inside of the tomb. It doesn't sound that hard, does it? Just make sure nobody outside of the tomb can get inside of the tomb. So we're going to place a guard and seal the tomb. It's foolproof. Except for one small problem that never occurred to them. It was so outrageous and so outlandish that the disciples never expected it either. That the real trick wasn't to keep people outside of the grave. The real trick was to keep Jesus inside of the grave. And so what for the Pharisees, they thought it was impossible, turned out not only to be probable, but inevitable because you can't keep God in a grave. Anybody? Thank you. Sorry, man, I, just, I get a little, it, it's getting warm in here. Just making sure you're with me. So let's close this thing out. Chapter 28, verse 1. After the Sabbath at dawn for the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He's risen just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Get this, they didn't roll the stone away so that Jesus could get out. The stone was rolled away so that they could get in and see he was gone. Because the risen Jesus, he doesn't need doors. Verse 7, then go quickly and tell his disciples, we have risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. And there you will see him. 
Now I've told you. And so the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshiped him. Now, I don't know about you, but if I saw somebody who I know was dead, buried, suddenly walking around, worshiping him is not my first move. <laughs> Run away in stark terror? Yes. Disbelief? Sure. Worship? Not my first move. But see, they weren't worshiping him because he came back from the dead. They were worshiping him because it was in rising from the dead he proved who he was. And he said, I am the very son of God. God made man incarnate. He's divine. And when somebody says, I'm divine, and then predicts their own death and then rises from the dead, you believe them. That's why they're worshiping him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And that's just what happens. And so Jesus goes, if you keep reading to the end of the chapter, Jesus goes and he reveals himself to his disciples and and to great crowds as well. And, and it's so interesting, though, because it says that, that many of them believed, but some doubted. I think because it was still just too good to be true. Maybe some of you are here this morning, and, and this whole God thing, this whole idea of believing in God, that just seems too far-fetched for you. It's just a, too, a stretch of your imagination, maybe a little bit too far for you, because... This idea of, of a man almost 2,000 years ago predicting his own death and then coming back to life and, and the idea that he is still alive today. It seems like such a crazy idea. It's beyond what you can imagine. And I can give you all kinds of historical evidence that shows that it is far more likely that Jesus did exactly what he said, that Jesus rose from the dead than any other alternative. Of the idea that the disciples concocted these stories or that they were hallucinating and having some sort of vision of Jesus or, or that uh, you know, they, they got confused somehow or these were myths that were developed over time, none of those theories hold water. N.T. Wright again, he puts it this way, no other explanations have been offered in 2,000 years of skepticism that can satisfactorily account for how the tomb came to be empty how the disciples came to see Jesus, and how their lives and worldviews were transformed. In other words, all the strongest, most compelling, best evidence that we have all points to the same thing, that Jesus truly rose from the dead. But I got to tell you, I don't think this is where most of us struggle. I think for most of us, the struggle is exactly what I've been saying, that it's that this still sounds too good to be true that often our skepticism is not a triumph of our reason, but a failure of our imagination. Because life has taught us that we shouldn't believe things that sound too good to be true. And nothing sounds more good, too good to be true than the idea that God so loved the world. That God so loved you. He so loved you in the mess of your life. And the mistakes that you've made and the failures that you've, you've struggled through, the disappointments that you've had, he's so loves you as you. that He was willing to give his only son, Jesus, who was willing to come and to die again for you so that you could have forgiveness for your sins. But, but not only that, but that he rose from the dead so that you could have the promise of eternal life. See, that, there's nothing that sounds more too good to be true than that. And yeah, I'm telling you, this is the very thing that your heart wants to be true. That, that everything within you, your heart, your soul, everything has been longing for, it is all found in this story, in this reality, that if, if Jesus rose from the dead, then there is a love that never fails that there is a hope that never ends, that there is a peace that never fades, and Jesus wants to give it to you. That if Jesus rose from the dead, there is coming a world in which justice will never be defeated, that, that good will always win, will always triumph, and the future will never end. That if Jesus rose from the dead, there is nothing that God wants to do in you and in your life that is too good to be true, because sometimes what sounds too good to be true, it's not a ruse, it's not a con, it's not a fairy tale, it's the very thing that you were created for. 
It's the very thing your whole life was meant for. This is what Jesus wants to bring to life in you. C.S. Lewis, he has this, this great line in one of his books where he says, if you find in yourself longings for things that this world cannot satisfy, he says it strongly suggests that you were made for a different world. See, this is the world that is not too good to be true. It's too good not to be true because it's the world that you were made for. This is the world that Jesus wants to bring to life in you. See, some of you, your hope in the future has died. The present is all you feel. It's all you know. You can't imagine a tomorrow that's better than today. Your hope has died, and Jesus wants to bring that hope back to life in you. He wants to, he wants to resurrect the love that you have for other people that has, has slowly dissipated. He, he wants to bring that joy back to life in you that has slowly died over the years. He, he wants to give you a peace that will actually outlast death itself. He wants to bring you back to life, mind and soul. But one day he wants to bring all of you back to life. All of you, your whole self, including your body. So that there's no more sickness and no, no more weakness and no more illness No more aches and pains and broken down parts, but you finally fully alive, fully you forever. That's what Jesus wants to do in you. It's not too good to be true. It's the very thing you were meant for. It's what you were made for. It's what Jesus wants to bring to life in you. If you would, just close your eyes with me. We're going to close and bow your heads. And if you're sitting there this morning and, and, you know, maybe you haven't been in church in a long time. Maybe you're just here because of Easter. And uh, and I'm so glad you're here. But maybe all this sounds so far-fetched to you. It sounds like such a crazy leap of imagination that God actually created you and loves you and that Jesus came to die for you and then he rose to life. This all sounds so crazy. And yet I want you to know that this is this is what you were made for, and that there, there's something in your heart and your soul that longs for this to be true. And maybe for the first time, you're starting to hope that it is. To hope that maybe, just maybe, Jesus is who he said he is, so that there is a hope for tomorrow, there is a future that you can look forward to, because this isn't the end of the story. There's an eternity. And so if that's you... I just want to encourage you right now that you can say to Jesus, Jesus, I want to believe. I want to believe. Help me in my own belief. And so Jesus, I'm choosing right now to believe that you died on the cross for my sins. And Jesus, I'm choosing to believe right now that you rose from the dead so that I could be forgiven and so that I could have the hope of eternal life. So Jesus, because you gave your life for me, I give you my life. And if you just told Jesus that, then that's, this is just the beginning. But if you told Jesus that, then Jesus, he comes into your life and he begins to bring you back to life. He gives you his spirit and he begins to remake you new. He begins to make you into the very person that he always created you to be. And if you just told Jesus that, if you just prayed that, I just want to encourage you to tell someone. You can come tell me. Uh, We're going to have uh, some elders up here up front. You can come and talk to them, tell them, share them the decision that you made this morning. Because Jesus gave him, gave you his life, you've given your life to him. It's the start of a whole new life for you. And we want to walk alongside you in that. Father, thank you that you loved us so much. In spite of all of our sin and all of our shame and all of our brokenness, that you were willing to give us your only son, Jesus. That you were willing to come and to die in our place. We can't even imagine that kind of love. We can't fathom that kind of grace. Lord, some of us this morning, we we wrestle with doubts and we struggle with believing that you are who you say you are. Help us in our unbelief. Help us to step into the life that you've called us to 
And we just trust in faith that you are remaking us. You are calling us into new life. And one day we will be fully made new. And Lord, we also just recognize that this is a process. And there are parts of our lives that are still needing to be resurrected. And God, we ask that you would do that. Give us new hope. Give us new joy. Give us new love. Give us new compassion. Renew all of those. Bring those to life again in us. Because we want to look like you. And we want to share you with the world. We thank you for this time, Jesus. Thank you that you are alive. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.